Good afternoon. My name is uh, Veronika Gavinska Bulekis. I represent the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. I'm honored to invite you to the second meeting of the project, The Seeds of History, organized by the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation and the Polish Diaspora Organization, Polish American Strategic Initiative, EDU. Today's event is entitled Witnesses to the Truth on Counting Heroism Behind the Iron Curtain, presentation of the book Encounter with Counting by Damian, uh, uh, by Professor Olszem. I would like to introduce our guest today, Mr. Jean Sokorowski, President of PASI EDU. Good, good afternoon. Professor Tadeusz Walsza, good afternoon. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, Dr. Damian Pentnowski, the Deputy President of the Antrikotika Foundation, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. And the meeting will be moderated by Mr. Edward Wojciech Jeschman, the President of um, uh, PASI, of the PASI. Hello. The Seeds of History project is financed by the Chancellor of the Prime Minister as part of the Polish Diaspora and Poles Abroad 2021 competition. And uh, uh, blockpress.pl is a media partner and would like to give the floor to Mr. Jean Sokolowski. Mr. President, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation's webinar with Professor Tadeusz Wolsza and his scholarly work titled Encounter with Katyn. I'm Dr. Jean Zabrowski, president of PASI EDU, also known as the Polish American Strategic Initiative Education Organization. Our primary mission is to educate Americans and interested others on Polish and Polish American history by accurately presenting the facts and effectively countering the distortions. Our distinguished guest today is Professor Tadeusz Wolsza, who is a widely recognized Polish historian and political scientist. Born in Poland, he graduated from the University of Wrocław and his academic affiliations include professor at the Institute of History at the Polish Academy of Sciences, <coughs> excuse me, professor at the Kazimierz Wielki University at Bydgoszcz and the Institute of National Remembrance. Professor Wolsza specializes in the contemporary history of Poland, particularly the wartime and post-war political, Polish political emigre community, the Katyn massacre, the anti-communist resistance movement in Poland, and Stalinist crimes in post-war Poland. He has published over 280 academic papers and books, with some of them translated into Russian, German, English, Italian, Serbian, and Slovakian. All of us at PASI and PASI EDU extend a warm welcome to Professor Volsha. Our moderator today is Edward Wojciech Jeszman, who is co-founder and president of the Polish American Strategic Initiative Incorporated. Born and raised in Poland, Mr. Me Re excuse me, Mr. Jeszman was a pro-democracy activist and a member of the anti-communist opposition in Poland during 1976 to 1982. He was also a political prisoner in 1978 and again in 1981 to 1982. In 1982, Mr. Yeshman became a political asylee in the United States. He's a naturalized U.S. citizen since 1990. He was president of the Polish National Congress of Southern California as well as National Director of the Polish American Congress National Organization from 2015 to 2020. An active Polish American lobbyist on Capitol Hill, he is also the recipient of the Officer's Cross of the Order Polonia Restituta and the Cross of Freedom and Solidarity. At this time, I will turn the program over to Mr. Damian Bednowski, Vice President of the Board of the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the entire team of uh, the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation in Warsaw for me. It is great honor as this is yet another meeting within the framework of this project, Seeds of History, that we can implement. Ladies and gentlemen, this project, this meeting, 
is a part uh, and parcel of the great mission of uh, our foundation, that is the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. And the flagship project of this foundation is uh, an award competition in the name of Janusz Kurtyka. That is to say, every year we award a prize to the best Polish um, historical work that um, uh, falls with, uh, in line with um, uh, the uh, main topic of uh, the competition. And it's not only a symbolic award uh, in the shape of a statuette that we uh, present uh, to the wind, but this is a very specific tool. This is an instrument that uh, should um, help us to boost activity, scientific activities all over the world. And we also provide for the translation of uh, the book awarded and uh, we are translating these books uh, into um, some of the languages and currently we are focusing on uh, publishing those books in the English language and also we translate into the German language in cooperation with very important and uh, recognized uh, publishing scientific publishing houses in the West. The winner of the first edition of the Janusz Kortyka Award competition was exactly Professor Adolf Wolscher. He is the main protagonist of our meeting tonight. And Professor, dear Professor, thank you very much for taking part in this meeting. We're going to talk about your book, Encounters with Katyn. And this is a, the book about the fate of witnesses of the Katyn massacre, the way the communist regime was prosecuting them as witnesses. So this is the book that outlines a broader perspective around the Katyn massacre. So the uh, program uh, council that um, took a decision to award you with the award in 2017 considers that this book fits very well um, our approach to the soft power of the Polish science. Um, and uh, undoubtedly, this uh, book um, is a part of the so-called scientific diplomacy. This is uh, how we use academic tools in order to um, influence the Western scientific world so that we can tell the Polish history, the true one, without stereotypes and uh, uh, and we present this story, history, without any distortions, so as uh, to present the Polish raison d'être, which is particularly important in the today's context, and it is very much needed and justified under the current, in the, within the current context. And another element of this award is uh, to promote the book. Uh, uh, Professor Wolcher's book has been translated into the English language and uh, it was published in cooperation with the Foundation, in cooperation with the Carolina Academic Press uh, Publishing House. And in order to expand the scope of uh, its um, influence and to present a broader scientific community, we organized in 2018, a tour with the participation of Professor Wolscher, that it was a promotional tour. He had an opportunity to visit uh, selected uh, intellectual centers in the United States of America. He, uh, that uh, was um, the tour under the title um, of Freedom. And this is when Professor had an opportunity to meet the representatives of the Polish diaspora. He also met American scientists and he was reading lectures that uh, referred to, uh, were related to the book, to the book's topic. Well, of course, this uh, is the process that takes time and uh, undoubtedly the book, even such a canon of, of a book still needs time to enter historiography. But undoubtedly, this particular book on the on the American market has been well received and noticed and recognized. And uh, for instance, Holocaust and Genocide Studies recognized this book and uh, it, um, is um, the position that is published by uh, the um, University Press. And this is the effect, the effect that we would like to augment and therefore quite a natural development for that project. Uh, 
um, of the uh, Janusz Kurtyka Awards is the today's project. And I would like to thank you for taking part in this project under the title Seeds of History. We would like to build a network of contacts with the important organizations, um, Polish diaspora organizations in the United States of America and in Canada. And uh, thus, we would like to increase uh, the presence of Polish historiography and Polish historical narrative in the Western scientific world. And uh, this is how we develop contacts. Uh, this is uh, how we um, reinforce um, uh, networking activities. And we do realize that, in fact, that this cooperation is at its initial stage, merely, and we know that we have very much ambitious plans, but uh, undoubtedly this meeting is um, um, something that will help us to address two principal problems. First, familiarity with the Polish history mostly related to facts that awareness is poor. First, it's quite poor in the Western societies, which is an issue which is quite obvious and doesn't need any special explanations. So there's another challenge that we have noticed, though. We have been cooperating with the Prime Minister's Chancellor. We'd like to address that challenge, too. Namely, let's talk about the Polish diaspora. People that have Polish roots, quite often, especially if they don't speak good Polish, they do not have access to good quality works, especially pertaining to the latest Polish history. And these are the two things that have actually encouraged us to take up this challenge. This is what has encouraged us to tell the history of Poland globally in cooperation with our friends from the Polish diaspora circles. For that reason, I would like to say thank you. Thank you to Polish American Strategic Initiatives EDU, Mr. Sokowowski. Sir, thank you for being so kind and working with us. Thank you for your participation in this meeting today. Thank you to another representative of the same organization, namely Mr. Wojciech Jeszman. Sir, it's very kind of you to moderate this meeting with Professor Volsha. And last but not least, the main protagonist of today's meeting, Professor Volsha. Sir, you has you have created a really major work, and what we are seeing in your work is something which is by no means a cliche. It is not a book that is focusing on the crime itself, on how it happened, or even on its international dimension, but we are able to find out more about the witnesses of this crime that also turned out to be victims of said crime. Thank you very much to the Foundation. Thank you, Professor for this important work. I hope that your work will be better visible, largely thanks to this project. And now we will have a short video that is dedicated to the book that we're going to discuss today. Enjoy. Forests can hold many secrets, both terrible and dark, hidden in the whispering trees, echoing in the ground. Secrets, lies, screams, gunshots, and truth. This is the tale of a half century of deceit, but also courage. The untold story of the Katyn massacre a brutal murder of thousands of Polish prisoners of war. In the spring of 1940, around 22,000 Polish military and civilian elites 
were executed in the shadows of the Catan Forest. A terrible history narrated by the witnesses who were kept silent for decades. Encounter with Catan by Professor Tadush Wolsha. Dziękuję serdecznie. Thank you very much. Let me give the floor to the moderator of today's meeting, Wojciech Jeszman. Sir, over to you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Jean. Thank you very much, Mr. Wembnowski, for the introductions. Um, I would like to thank you uh, for uh, pre your preparation uh, of, of this uh, event, and uh, without you, obviously, this would not uh, have happened. Uh, Professor Volsha, thank you very much for your cooperation and participation, and thank you also for years of uh, scholarship and uh, the depth of it. Uh, I would like to uh, start with a few very general remarks, because uh, cutting is not just a historical issue. Uh, this is a very much a contemporary issue that affects uh, also, lots of things here uh, in the United States, even now. Um, no, main issue is that uh, uh, language controls memory. And uh, uh, cutting uh, is uh, portrayed here in so many different ways, but not really in a proper way. Uh, so it is uh, called uh, crime, murders, uh, political assassinations, uh, war crimes. But very uh, unusual is the a uh, proper uh, use of language here, which uh, uh, suggests that we should really uh, stay uh, with a, a proper designation for it, uh, which is uh, genocide. And uh, um, uh, what happened in Katyn uh, uh, is uh, an expression uh, of uh, genocide in the, its purest form and uh, uh, basically meets all the characteristics of the uh, genocide. Uh, for political reasons, both historically as well, well uh, right now contemporary, uh, this is uh, avoided. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of uh, attempts to uh, avoid, falsify, and to reclassify this uh, um, event. And um, it is uh, uh, in our best interest, actually, to uh, stick with the proper designations here. And uh, uh, this is not just a matter of, of media. Um, uh, it is also a part of uh, the uh, political uh, struggles that we have here in the United States on the legislative uh, uh, level. Uh, very often uh, American politicians um, try to avoid uh, this subject uh, and also to try to uh, keep it uh, as a, a case of, of just regular war crime. Um, we cannot really allow it. Uh, this is not in our uh, best national interest. Uh, we should uh, uh, keep the subject uh, uh, still alive and uh, really uh, make sure that uh, we don't uh, allow a uh, history of uh, our nation to be uh, falsified. Uh, uh, so this is a matter of uh, actually a concert, concerted effort uh, on, the, on the part of many different players. It's not just uh, that uh, Russians uh, or Americans uh, are no, not very uh, keen on uh, proper classification here. Uh, we have also um, uh, Germans and uh, Jewish interests that uh, don't really uh, like uh, uh, Poland to be um, in, in the light uh, uh, and uh, don't, don't like uh, this uh, historical issues uh, to have uh, proper designations. Um, uh, this happens for different reasons, uh, but, uh, you know, effect is, is the same. Uh, Germans try to uh, dilute uh, the responsibility for the Second World War. Um, so uh, any kind of... Uh, uh, present uh, mentioning of uh, Polish uh, suffering, uh, either 
are caused by German or Russian sites. And uh, we have to remember that initially for the first uh, two, two years uh, until uh, Russia was invaded by Germany, there was a very good cooperation as far as uh, uh, genocidal aspects uh, of uh, occupation of, of Polish territories uh, by Russians and Germany. Uh, the same with uh, uh, Jewish interest. There is uh, uh, an effort to game this uh, uh, in a sense of uh, um, obtaining advantages uh, as far as uh, political and economic uh, uh, sphere. Uh, Americans always used uh, Poland as a bargaining chip uh, uh, in contacts with Russia, so uh, this issue also is not really uh, properly exposed here most of the time. And uh, we had a few uh, cases uh, historically, uh, 1952, uh, Ray Madden uh, Commission uh, that uh, uh, undertook uh, investigation of the subject on the congressional level, but uh, not much really came out of it. And uh, on this subject is still uh, uh, not, not uh, 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 properly handled here. Uh, uh, there, there needs to be some final resolution to it. And uh, this is not... Uh, that we are uh, trying to push this subject as some kind of uh, anti-Russian uh, politics uh, here. It's rather a matter of, uh, of, of truth and uh, uh, final closing of this uh, uh, issue. Uh, no, the Russians don't want to accept that this was a genocidal action. Uh, they always stick to the uh, theory that this was just a part of uh, uh, communist crimes. Uh, not, it's, it's not the case because of the fact that uh, um, this was uh, a willful uh, and conscious uh, and that attempt to eliminate uh, approximately one third uh, of uh, Polish officer corps. Uh, uh, if we look at the uh, numbers, uh, pre-war pre numbers. Um, so th this is one of the definitions that obviously uh, needs to be uh, uh, kept uh, in, in our uh, memory uh, because uh, we tend to forget about things. Uh, there is lots of neglect uh, as far as uh, historical narration in the United States. And unfortunately, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, this uh, issue of almost dereliction of duty here uh, on our part. Uh, we have generational uh, responsibility to uh, keep certain uh, issues alive and uh, defend the uh, good name of uh, Poland and uh, uh, we have to defend uh, Polish national interests. Uh, unfortunately, there is lots of uh, polonophobic attitudes uh, in the United States and um, we can see it uh, in media, we can see it uh, in academia and also on the legislative uh, level uh, in the US Congress. Uh, very often those things uh, come up. Um, so uh, we have to be better organized. Uh, we have to also uh, make sure that uh, events like this are continued. I hope that this is just the first step um, on a, a much closer cooperation between uh, academic circles in Poland and also our organizations in the United States here. Uh, there is a need for uh, not only uh, lectures, but uh, also conferences. And uh, we would be uh, very happy to be a part of it. Uh, uh, educational uh, side of it is important, but also we have to remember that uh, ultimately uh, this is about uh, politics and uh, we have to be also uh, cognizant of the fact that we should be present uh, on a legislative level here. and. Uh, uh, we have to also uh, lobby uh, American administration uh, very often uh, on many different issues. Uh, I would like to uh, also say that uh, we have a very general problem that uh, actually um, erases Poland uh, from this uh, equation here completely almost in the United States. Uh, there is uh, uh, a problem with the American education in general that uh, 
basically treats uh, the Second World War uh, almost uh, in the context of uh, a extermination of, of Jewish population of Europe. And uh, uh, there is uh, uh, this uh, issue of uh, so-called uh, holocaustization of uh, American education. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, counteract uh, Poland's uh, uh, suffering cannot be erased from history. And uh, uh, this is very important that uh, we do our best uh, to uh, make sure that uh, uh, this does not uh, happen. Um, so I will finish maybe here. Uh, I would like to uh, give floor to uh, Professor Tadeusz Wolsza. Uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, I would like to invite you to thank you for your kind invitation to take part of this meeting. I would like uh, to say that for me as an author, it is a very pleasant event for any author. It is a pleasant event to be able to meet the readers and to present the book, particularly given the fact uh, that uh, among the participants of this meeting, we have not only Polish readers of the book, we have quite a white group of people who are interested in the history of Poland and the cutting massacre is a part of our history, a very tragic event in the Polish history. And one of the gentlemen said that uh, almost one third of the officer's corps was murdered then. But please uh, remember that uh, primarily those uh, were soldiers in the reserve. Most of them were uh, the officers in reserve. Um, prior to the outbreak of uh, World War II. And um, at that time, um, and after uh, being trained in the army, they were already working as intelligent intelligentsia. In the, they were medical doctors, lawyers, professors, journalists. Those um, were social and uh, political activists. Those were the true elite. So if you think of that event, how to call that cutting event to say that that was genocide is a very proper description of that event. The objective was crystal clear to eliminate, to liquidate the Polish elite, uh, um, the most dangerous part of Polish society for the Soviets, because the society devoid of the elite is an easy prey to manipulate. And now just a few words of what I'm going to talk about. Let me give you an outline. First and foremost, I would like to talk about some, uh, I'll give some brief information about the massacre itself, uh, because it is important uh, from the point of view of uh, my subsequent parts of uh, my presentation today. And on the basis of the decision of uh, March 1940, the uh, supreme authorities of um, the Soviet Union, and let me just mention to, uh, Stalin on the basis of the expertise presented by Lavrenti Beri, and he was uh, the commissioner for security matters. Um, the, the authorities took a decision to murder all Polish citizens in Ostashko Starobelski, Ostashko uh, Starobelski, and Kosciusk, but not only in those three camps. In fact, um, that was the decision that referred to more than a dozen of um, prisons uh, spread around the territories of Western U Ukraine and Belarus. Therefore, the number of the murdered exceeded significantly uh, the number of 14,500 persons because that was the init initial count of those who were apprehended and then uh, sent uh, to the prisoners camp and uh, to that, we should add the new prisoners and arrested. And within that, we had uh, people of uh, different professions and different uh, uh, different political views. And we had there were people who, from the point of view of Polish authorities, could in the future pose a threat uh, to the reinforcement of the Soviet authority in the occupied territories. Therefore, that number increased uh, to. Uh, 22,000 people plus, but that is not a closed list. And I would like to underscore that because we still do not know 
the uh, the the numbers on the so-called Belarusian list, and it uh, may well happen that the twenty-two thousand people that this number shall be further increased by a certain number of victims we do not know yet. They mm, were buried in many different places so as to conceal the scale of the cutting massacre. So the case of the uh, cutting massacre was a very important case for the Polish government in exile in London. For one reason, the Poles, the Polish government, after the shikorsky maisky um, treaty signet, uh, was was signed, uh, um, they could establish the Polish army in the east, and uh, General Anders uh, commanded the armor, and most of uh, a lot of his life he uh, spent in Lubyanka, starting beginning with 1939 until 1941. So he was a prisoner number one, as uh, far as. Um, the rank of uh, the Polish officers is concerned in, uh, who were imprisoned in the Soviet Union. But once he was freed and once he was nominated to, uh, to the commander of the Polish army in the East, he immediately started looking for those officers. But his quest uh, um, was unsuccessful. The Soviets knew about the crime, obviously, and um, therefore um, they were, um, in fact, uh, not capable of giving any giving any credible answers as to the fate of the Polish officers. They were giving some absurd type of information. And they, for instance, they were saying that the Polish officers either uh, ran away to Manchuria or perhaps uh, the Polish officers were somewhere in the Far East and it was merely a matter of time for them to return and thus uh, join the ranks of um, the uh, Second Corps because that was the name of the military formation that was uh, being established by General Anders. So General Anders was cognizant of the fact that uh, matters were taking a bad turn and it was exceedingly difficult to understand the fate of the Polish officers. And, uh, and um, Yusuf Czapski became the his uh, plenipotentiary for the search of um, the Polish officers and Józef Czapski used to be a prisoner in Starobielsk. He was one in one of those uh, camps uh, from which Polish officers were shot, executed. He started, uh, Józef Czapski started his quest, but um, he failed. Although there was a certain point of time during uh, Józef Czapski's uh, uh, mission that he um, understood that it was very important to, to uh, see um, what the fate of the Polish officers because once he came across a map and on that map he saw that some sites on the territory in the territory of the Soviet Union were marked with stars. At that time he didn't know what he saw but sometime later once uh, the cutting massacre became an international uh, case after 1943, he came to a conclusion that he had already seen a map with the stars indicating the places of imprisonment of the Polish officers. So those sites with the red stars, those were the sites of the camps for Poles. But at that time, he had not known it uh, somewhere in the beginning of 1942 when he first saw the map. So it was only later on that he could uh, verify that knowledge uh, but uh, the Poles were no longer in the Soviet Union at the time because General Anders army left the Soviet Union in spring 1942. So uh, he thought of that map but a bit later on and uh, only the Germans in 1943 in April released information on the discovery of um, the burial sites of the Polish officers in Katyn. And uh, this is when the Katyn massacre case uh, be, uh, was on the table again. The Germans were 100% sure that it was not their crime. Therefore, they immediately made it a very loud case. No, they were not in support of Poland. It was not that the Germans all of a sudden became fond of the Poles, but Germans knew one thing, that it was important for them, not the Poles. It was important from the German point of view. They knew that the crime against the Polish officers done by the Soviets could have affected the course of the war, maybe indirectly, but still at least that was the case 
that could um, drive a wedge between the allies. So, so uh, Goebbels thought that would uh, actually make uh, the allies uh, quarrel. And this is what he had in mind when he presented the case uh, to Hitler. He said at the time that this is the card they could play for months uh, to go. The cotton would give us fuel, he said, uh, to weaken the alliance. Uh, Perhaps uh, the Americans and the British will stop cooperation with the Soviets, and that may alter the course of the war. So the Germans hoped for that. The truth was different, and the English and the Americans uh, did not uh, sacrifice the Soviets. They sacrificed uh, the Polish government in exile because uh, for them, the union with the Soviet Union was more important. The alliance with the Soviet Union was more important than the alliance with the Polish government in exile. And uh, the Soviet Union was ready uh, to march thousands of uh, soldiers uh, to the front line. And uh, the Polish resources for it had been exhausted by that time. So there was Anglo-Saxon logic about it. And um, the Anglo-Saxons were looking at those events, not from the point of view of the Polish-English alliance. It was rather a case of benefits. So the more Soviet troops are on the front line, the fewer American and British soldiers would die on in Western Europe and in the Far East. So the Poles, the Poles uh, who had been guests on the British Isles for many years, all of a sudden became intruders. Hence the German idea to utilize the Katyn massacre. But it was no to benefit to them as the Germans, but still it was something that uh, um, helped the Polish initiatives uh, to investigate the case. And that is why in the release of information about the massacre in 1943 by the Germans is so very much important from the point of view of uh, investigating all those um, questions related to the events uh, uh, that took place in spring in 1940. So in 1943, Germans were very serious about it. They were very attentive to it. They wanted the international organization uh, they wanted the International uh, Red Cross uh, to investigate the case and the Polish government in exile had ex a similar idea and the Polish uh, government addressed uh, the International Red Cross with a request to deal with this case. But to, do, to deal with that case, the International Red Cross had to receive an approval from all the stakeholders. Who were the stakeholders? Germany because those were the ones who found out about the case. It was the Polish authority, because it was the case about the Polish citizens. But there is the third country, a very important country at stake, which is was the Soviet Union, because the crime was committed in the territory of the Soviet Union. So the International Red Cross received um, a green light from the Germans and the Poles, but not from the Soviet Union. And therefore, that case at that time, in 1943, that case uh, collapsed. Uh, but what was the result of it? The Soviets received an opportunity to utilize that in event in the future. And in the future, they would say that the Polish government was cooperating with the Nazi Germany because they together applied to the International Red Cross to investigate the case. So for the Soviets, it was a very important argument in the propaganda um, act, uh, act type of activity. And um, when the case uh, was uh, finally not uh, filed with the International Red Cross Committee, the Germans decided that they will take a different course, but still they would pursue an international pathway. So the Germans established an international medical committee. The International Medical Committee comprised uh, a dozen or so of medical doctors from the occupied territories. That was the weak point of uh, that committee. The only um, neutral medical doctor was uh, Francois Leville from Switzerland, and he was the, a guarantor of the neutrality of investigation. He was there to guarantee the credibility of the investigation because an in, in invitation so were addressed to the Spanish and Swedish and Portuguese and Turkish medical doctors, but those invitations had not been accepted. It, even if, uh, had they even been accepted, uh, still 
and there was a problem with Antonio Piquet from Spain and um, it all failed and Antonio Piquet at the very last moment of time decided not to travel and therefore he never reached the captain. So that international um, um, physicians um, uh, committee um, initiated investi investigative activities and they confirmed the responsibility of the Soviet government. Ferenc Orsha and Garin doctors of an important member of this committee. He looked at the residue from the graves and he was able to date and the date was spring 1940 and basically the committee opined I used the word similar to judgment. So they judged it to be the case that it was the Soviets who were responsible and the crime was committed in the spring 1914. And the Polish Technical Committee of the Polish Red Cross also received that information. By the way, they had been sent that to identify the body. So there are two parallel committees, the International Red Cross Committee, the Polish Red Cross Committee, and before that there had been a German committee as well. The Central Army Committee, headed by General Gerald Butz, who was a professor. And basically these are the first witnesses. They are there, they are in Katyn, and they can look at the remains of the people that are being disinterred. People do research, doctors actually research the evidence they have. It, it, the medicine actually was of high quality. Once they said, if Ferenc Horsos had announced that research and there had been no World War II, in all probability, he might have been given Nobel Prize in medicine. At the time, it seemed improbable. Some people tended to disbelieve his words, but then it turned out to be true. And later, doctors, various doctors who worked on the case, used Ernst's research, which was of very high quality indeed, and it played an important role at the time. So, the Germans decided to issue an invitation to invite people to cut and from, basically to invite witnesses from all over Europe, occupied Europe that is. To them, it was important to invite people from the general governorship and they wanted to invite mostly Poles, the Polish witnesses who would come over, watch, listen to commentaries, and then they would disseminate this information, not only in occupied Poland, but also to spread it further, to disseminate it further, including to the Polish government in exile. They wanted cutting to be as powerful as possible. So they wanted to invite scientists and doctors and writers and journalists as well. Basically people who were in touch with the media. Notice, this is a calculated effort on the part of the Third Reich to prove that it was the Soviets who were responsible. Who would do it better? Journalists who know how to write, and then scientists who would confirm the results of the work of the previous committee, and writers who would write books on the very subject. These people have power because they are in touch with media. Radio played a very important role as well at that time. The year is 1943. Radio there? How come, you could ask? What the Germans did, they came up with this radio studio. There were microphones placed next to the graves. And they were 
actually recording everything that was happening there, including the commentaries. Then all that evidence was being sent to Berlin. German radio stations would use those recordings in the German Nazi propaganda. Quite revolutionary, you could say. 1943, almost live, it was as early as, early as that that somebody came up with this ingenious idea. They also had special equipment to record records and they recorded interviews, opinions provided by witnesses, photos were taken of all the people present them present there rather and anyone who arrived there would receive a number of various artifacts that were uncovered it could be a button from a military uniform or something else a token to remember this visit some people would get into a grave and collect the grave the ropes used to tie the hands of the Polish officers. We know of at least two such cases. So Germans would actually do that. There are such ropes still available. I believe one of them is still in London. In uh, one of the museums there. So a large scale campaign. A lot of resources and many people were involved. So many people, many resources. So a question arises. How many witnesses were involved? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure if you know. 31,000 people were brought over by the Germans. And mind you, it's not a mistake, 31,000 people. It's the war, the war is raging. It's the East, and they were able to transport as many as 31,000 people to witness what happened there. Mind you, these are uh, th 30,000 Wehrmacht soldiers and 1,000 were the remaining guests. Why so many German soldiers? It was about making the German soldiers believe that it's worthwhile to fight the Soviets. If you fight poorly, if you yield, said the officers to the soldiers, this is the fate that awaits you. This is what's going to happen to you, said the officers to regular soldiers. Now, the Polish national interest is somewhat different. We don't care so much about what's going to happen to the Germans. We would like Germany to lose the war. And the members of the Polish delegations have something else on their minds. So Poles go there, they go to cutting so that finally they can resolve the following important issue, why and when the Polish officers died. And there, and then they learn that they died in 1940 and the Soviets are the perpetrators. So this is the first group of the Polish delegates who visited Katyn. I did quite a lot of deep research there. Nine, in 1943, around 60 people left, I mean, people who had visited the place where the crime was committed. Józef Matzkiewicz, Fardynian Getel, Jan Emil Skipski, and other journalists and writers, and doctors too. Marian Wojcicki, the head of the Polish Red Cross Committee, a forensic doctor, Kazimierz Skarżyński, the deputy president of the Polish Red Cross Committee. These are important people who will later 
give testimony on that crime. And there is another important group of witnesses, around 400 of them. So, in 1940, where the Polish officers were being executed, Soviets decided not to murder around 400 people in the first three sites because they decided that they, they could come in handy later due to their scientific achievements, their professions. They could be useful for the Red Army later on or for the Soviet politics and the economy. Stanislav Svianiewicz, a professor of the Stefan Butter University in Vilnius, was one of them. He was an expert in the German and Soviet economy. There are many other of them, 400 of them altogether. And they knew a lot, as it later turned out, about the Katyn massacre. I'm not going to discuss them separately, but a few words about Zinsław Svianiewicz, what role he could actually play. By the way, he was very close to dying. He was taken away from Kozielsko to Gniezdów, and there he got separated from the group that he was with, his colleagues, who were taken by a mysterious truck with tainted windows, and this car was absent for 30 minutes, then it was back. Sienewicz didn't know what happened to his friends. There he was, in the train, he was trying to eavesdrop and look through the cracks to see what was going on, but he was lost, he didn't know. Only lazy years later did he learn what this half an hour was all about. It was as much time as was needed to drive from one place to another, from the train to the site of the execution. Now, we are talking about a puzzle. And Svianiewicz was an important witness who helped to put the piece of the puzzles together because he knew a lot about how it all happened, how the events unfolded. And he reported all that before the Katyn Committee. It worked in World War II. It was then that he sent his testimony to a number of organizations, including the Polish government in exile. He also testified before the Madden committee, and he actually reiterated all of that in the early 50s. So I divided witnesses into two groups, first-hand witnesses and second-hand witnesses, so to speak. So direct witnesses were, are those who were there in 1940. And there are also those who were there, but three years later. The first group are the survivors. They personally experienced these events. They were friends with people who died there. For some time, they might have been unaware of what had happened there. Later, the Katyn massacre became international. It was after 1943 and after the, the end of the Second World War. And, and then they realized that the crime was committed and was committed by the Soviets in 1940. The other group are those who were there in 1943, invited by the Germans and the one who worked for International Medical Committee. They were not the ones who were POWs or people who were imprisoned in those three murder sites. We're talking about Kozielsk, Kostaszkov and Starobiersk. And then 
that Soviet committee asked Burbenko to create the, his own commission, which put into doubt the, um, the German works, claiming that actually it was the Germans who committed the crimes in 1941, and the POWs were taken over by the Germans who murdered all the Poles. That was the Soviet version, and it introduced some mess. The English-speaking nations stood by the Soviet Union, and what surfaced was the Soviet interpretation. It was an attempt to influence the Polish government in exile. And so they even apologized uh, to Moscow they he apologized to Stalin and uh, then he claimed that Germany was responsible for the Katyn massacre. The Polish authorities behaved the only way they could at that time. They simply did not take any position. And the situation of the Polish government at that time was very dramatic. One may say that um, the position of the Polish government in London was um, deteriorated a lot and the English were vociferous uh, in saying that the Poles were not helpful, they were interfering and uh, therefore the Polish government was tactically silent and that tactical silence uh, was helpful um, to Stalin and it was useful to Stalin. So the Russians decided to to go further with this case after the end of the war. So, being cognizant of the fact that Poland was already a communist country, that Poland was dominated by the NKVD and uh, by the communists, they decided to, to uh, stage uh, a court on cutting in uh, Warsaw. And this is how they would play Germany for the cutting massacre. So, they started looking for witnesses on the mass scale, on the grand scale, obviously looking for those who were in cutting. And uh, quite naturally, they were interested in the Poles that uh, visited cutting in 1943. So they were looking for Skarzynski, for Czinski, for Szabesta, for Edward Gorski, and uh, uh, for medical doctors and, and also staff of the Polish Red Cross who visited um, the site. Uh, some of them were found and they were forced to change their opinion on uh, the cutting massacre, the cutting crime. And uh, some people knew what was happening. Fertin Getel and Piski and Władysko Kabecki, Józef Matskiewicz, or for instance, some other people, they knew what was happening and they fled because they knew that if they were caught by the Soviets, then they would either be imprisoned and they would have uh, to serve a prison sentence or they will actually be murdered. So the process was there. There was a team of uh, public prosecutor, Robert Martini, who was a very good lawyer, who was a medical doctor at the University of Jan Kazimierz in uh, Lvov uh, before the war, was a very good lawyer. And um, a highly competent lawyer was uh, leading the team of prosecutors, and he had a team of very good lawyers. Those were the graduates of the Aguilar University. So they collected the documents, they did the interviews, they were really good and diligent in their work. But once all the files were collected, they came to the conclusion that it would be not possible to prove that the Germans uh, committed the crime. And uh, witnesses were saying different things. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, being um, under duress. So the cutting process in Warsaw didn't work and the Roman Martini was murdered in a, myst in a mysterious way, but uh, it was not a political murder. I think uh, it was more of a personal matter because he was killed uh, by a fiancé of a woman with whom he had um, intimate contacts. So, Therefore, Minister Świątkowski, the Minister of Justice in the Communist Poland, was summoned to Moscow and he was ordered to forget about the cutting uh, process in Warsaw. 
which is not to say that the Soviets dropped the idea of proving that they were innocent. Another attempt was undertaken by them during the meeting of the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, 1946. And that second attempt was to prove to the whole world that it was not a crime committed by the Soviets. Yuri Pokrovsky, the Soviet prosecutor, based his submissions on an important uh, circumstance, finding rather, and that what gave uh, uh, Soviet Russia a priority because the prosecutors from the US, from, uh, uh, from Britain and from the Soviet Union already at their first meeting as uh, they were forming the tribunal, they established that individual cases shall be run by those prosecutors who are most interested in that particular case. So as far as the cutting case is concerned, of course, the Soviets were very much interested in that um, in that case because the, the cutting massacre took place in the territory of the Soviet Union. So it was Soviet priority, a matter of Soviet priority. So Pokrovsky had a very important argument and therefore he came to a conclusion, an idea that he would run that case in his own way. So he would run this case in any way that would be beneficial to the Kremlin. Therefore, during the first meeting on the uh, cutting massacre, he defined that as an act of genocide. It, so it was not an idea of American or Polish or uh, British prosecutors. It was Pokrovsky's idea. Pokrovsky was sure, confident that he would be capable of running the case in during the Nuremberg trial in an easy way. So he already then used the notion of the German, or of the crime committed, of the crime of genocide committed by the Germans. But the Americans and the British were rather skeptical. Only that their arguments were not as convincing and they were not really confident in the Germans being innocent and only the activities of German defending lawyers um, who were defending German citizens, including criminals who were responsible for war crimes during World War II, um, that actually helped the Americans and the British to take a decision because uh, the defending lawyers from Germany submitted a request to many different institutions to provide for legal aid. That is, of course, a modern legal um, a speak, but at that time it was not the case uh, the, the named that way, but uh, they asked um, uh, the uh, Polish general to submit some materials in order to uh, help them to defend uh, the uh, German citizens, some of them criminals, and General Anders said that he would not cooperate with the Germans because they were criminals, but cutting had to be explained. And that is why Poland, in a very, should I, how should I put it, illegally, passed on some of uh, that uh, documentation. So using an, an using Mr. Szymanski, an American uh, officer of the Polish origin, to pass on some of the documentation to Americans. So Germans had some additional documentation available, a very important piece of documentation that was made available to the Germans, and it was made available by the Poles. So the final was uh, such that in Nuremberg, they did not decide who uh, murdered the Polish officers in Katyn. Germany was not uh, convicted for that uh, crime. Uh, the case was silenced, but the entire world asked, started thinking, if not the Germans, then who? The Poles could not possibly kill themselves. And it, there was no such official record in the final document of the Nuremberg trials, but still this can be understood as a great success on the way to explain uh, the uh, cutting massacre. And um, that was also uh, the merit of German lawyers, but also Polish witnesses who did not speak in Nuremberg, but before that they had already submitted their witness statements and their witness statements were heard in Nuremberg or sent to Nuremberg trial. But it was important to see that the Germans at that time 
claimed that uh, Friedrich Arons, a German officer, was um, responsible for that crime, as uh, he allegedly was a commander of the German execution squad in Katyn. So that name was used by the Soviet prosecutors as the, they were leading the case, and the G German uh, solicitors found that particular officer in 1946. He was a communications officer. He was not a criminal. He was taken to Nuremberg. And on the basis of the then available documentation, it was proved, proven that in September 1941, when the Poles were to be allegedly murdered by the Germans, that officer was very far away from Katyn, and his communications battalion regiment had nothing to do with Katyn at all. And that was another very important argument in the case. And then silence fell, the blanket of silence fell, and uh, the Katyn case was no longer uh, proceeded in the international arena. So the Soviets uh, were defeated. Another important event, that was uh, the Madden Committee. And um, the, this is how Americans, primarily Americans, uh, um, started dealing with the uh, Kate massacre. So apart uh, from uh, Nuremberg trials, the Americans and the British were not really interested in the Katyn massacre. They were avoiding the case. They simply wanted to maintain good relations with the Soviets and the Americans and the British thought it was not uh, worth picking up the case because that could spoil the relations. However, once the Soviet Union changed its policy around the world, and uh, that was already the context of the Korean War, the United States of uh, America um, assumed a different position with regard to the Katyn massacre. New, New York, in New York, there were information, there was information about um, American officers being uh, murdered in Korea using the cutting shot in the back of the head. And it was not Korean's idea. So earlier on, Polish officers had been killed in exactly the same way. So American officers were killed with a shot in the back of a head. So all of a sudden cutting found its place to the public discourse in the United States of America. The case had to be investigated. So the Ray Madden Committee received the right to deal with uh, the investigation of the cutting massacre because it became an important case from the point of view of uh, propaganda, but also in uh, the uh, US policy uh, with regard to the Soviet Union. So the Ray Madden Committee is very important more than 280 witnesses were heard by the Ray Madden Committee that were working in the US, in Britain, in Western Germany. They heard witnesses from many different countries. First and foremost, they wanted to, to hear as many Polish witnesses as possible. So General Volkowicki, um, uh, who was in Kosciuszko, um, submitted his deposition to remain um, uh, Mr. Cicha, Colonel Lubaczewski, Stanisław Sianiewicz also made their depositions. So their, those depositions were made by those who were credible, by those who had knowledge. Those were the people who were imprisoned by the Soviets and those were the people who had something to do with that case. So Americans found Gertel Matskevich, Chapsky, and they uh, addressed General Anders. So the Ray Madden Committee heard the depositions of the, in, uh, uh, of the International Medical Committee summoned by the Germans, François Leville, the Hungarian um, medical doctor. Many doctors, those medical doctors who were in Katyn 1943 investigating the case, they also were making their depositions to the Ray Madden Committee also. Famous. John Van Vliet, famous American officer, um, made his deposition to Ray Madden Committee. He was a German prisoner of war who in 1943 visited uh, Katyn because the, the Germans uh, also took uh, some uh, prisoners uh, to Katyn and John Van Vliet wrote a number of reports. Uh, and, uh, in 1944, in 1945, those uh, reports were hidden 
somewhere there in the archives of the White House. Uh, but after the war, he recreated those documents. And all of a sudden, it turned out that those documents were very important. Those were documents of um, really great, great significance. So the Great Madam Committee determined clearly that the crime was committed, committed by the Soviets in 1940. And that document with that particular conclusion was um, sent uh, to the uh, countries uh, behind the curtain wall. So that document, those conclusions were forwarded to, to the Soviet Union and to Poland and to other countries. What was the Kremlin's reaction? Quite obviously, the Kremlin rejected the conclusions of the Ray Madam Committee. And in a very um, shrewd way, the Kremlin unleashed a counter offensive. So the Soviets wrote back saying that beginning in 1944, when uh, Nikolai Burdenko's committee was working, Americans had eight years to reject uh, Burdenko's conclusions. And for eight years, Americans did nothing. Uh, to uh, start any discussions on Burdenko's conclusions. And what does it mean that eight years later, Americans now would alter something that had already been decided upon? So uh, it was very much a shrewd tactic. And um, so Americans' loyalty before that uh, played against the Americans in 1950s. So the Ray Madden Committee conclusions were not acknowledged uh, in uh, the countries that we were behind the Iron Curtain. So in the United Nations, he could not succeed either. You need to be anonymous to pass a resolution to you. And then you can guess who protested. First and foremost, it was the Soviet Union and the Polish delegate. They said that nobody should actually study that. So Ray Madden's committee's work was very important. It was significant because it helped to clarify the circumstances surrounding the cutting crime. In 1952, though, it had no impact on shedding light on this issue in the Western countries on the other side of the Iron Curtain, or, or rather in the other on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So in the eastern part of Europe, the crime had allegedly been committed by the Germans. In Poland, though, there were some protests. There were certain individual actions and protests taken by people who demanded that it's clarified. However, the Polish communist courts would send those people to jail. So in the Soviet occupied Poland, or the Poland controlled by the Soviets after 1945, Basically, there were dozens of people who were sent to prison for presenting the truth. And the USSR had their own policy. They rejected the truth about the cat in crime. And they came up with two other messages. The anti catin is the first one, namely, yes, we did commit the crime, but there was another crime that is, the crime committed by the Polish soldiers on the Soviet POWs after the Polish-Soviet war. This anti-cutting concept was propagated by the Soviets and the Russians after 1989. So you've got cutting on the one hand and the anti-cutting crime. So cutting is the lesser crime or rather anti-cutting is a lesser crime than cutting. What did the Soviets or rather Russians claim? They claimed that 14,000 people died there because they stuck to that version. Now, they suggested that Poles 
murdered over 30,000 Red Army soldiers in the aftermath of the Polish Soviet war. And Hutin is another thing. Basically, in English, you write it the same way. What is it about? So there is cutting in another location, and there Germans murdered a whole village. So the delegations that came to the USSR in the 70s and 80s, they would be taken on a trip to Hattin. And there, the American delegations and Western European delegations, as well as people from Central and Eastern Europe, they said, this is Hattin, or rather Katin, as it was pronounced in English. And this is where Germans murdered a huge number of people, including members of the families. And it is now a part of the dramatic history of the Soviet Union. Few people realized that it was manipulation. So there are two separate locations, and in English they are spelled the same way. In Polish or in other languages, they sound separately, they sound differently. However, since they sound the same way in English, it confused the situation, it muddled the waters, and this is what the Soviets were after. They didn't want the situation to be clear, they wanted things to be disputable, because when things are not clear, you can manipulate facts and witnesses play no role at all. So, the Americans and the Western politicians that visited Hattin basically fell for that Soviet trick. Nineteen ninety, on the 13th of April, this is when the situation was solved, because a Soviet agency, press agency, that announced the truth about the massacre the chapter is closed, but not really, because it was about, you know, it takes some time before, they took some time before they actually diverge from that version of, the, of, of events again. And now they have another narrative. They are those Russian pseudo historians. They publish books and papers and they promote another version of history. Basically, it was the 1941 that the Germans committed the crime. By the way, these are close to the highest echelon of the Russian power at this point. So they are not just uh, third tier historians, no. And for that reason, we need to keep discussing this subject. We need to keep talking about that. Here, we in Poland, we know the truth. We have all these history books. There are academic conferences, TV shows, TV documentaries. And we know for a fact who was responsible. What about Russia? What about the Russian Federation? Imagine that you organize a query there. Well, I'm afraid of the results, of the potential results that you will get there. I believe it would be 50-50. What do I mean by that? People would claim that it was not the Soviets, but the Germans who were responsible, who were responsible, and it could be even worse. Memorial, just a small number of heroic Russians who worked in Russia, activists, they were quite heroic, but whatever truth they uncovered was hidden. The members of this group 
fall prey to persecution and repressions. They are being persecuted by the authorities. This is the end of my lecture, and I'm at your service, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Professor Volchad, uh, we have a few questions here. So uh, the first question um, concerns um, a possible cooperation. Uh, I cannot hear you, said the professor. Um, I'm unmuted right now. Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Tak, ja słyszę, yes. Okay. Oh, okay, yes, I can hear you. So the first question um, deals with the possible and actually factual cooperation of uh, Germans and Russians until 1941. Um, so we know about uh, meetings uh, that uh, uh, were directed towards uh, actually coordination of the different uh, actions against the uh, Polish uh, uh, intellectuals, uh, Polish elites, uh, uh, both uh, on uh, territories occupied by Germany as well as uh, Russia. So uh, could you shed some light on it? Uh, is it possible that uh, Germans uh, had uh, foreknowledge of the uh, crime? crime? Right. I will take these questions one by one. I believe this would be the best way to go. This is an important question. In the cat and crime discourse, what you see often is the potential German-Soviet cooperation. Until June 1941, Soviets and Germans had been working closely. It was Poland that was their enemy. Now, where did they cooperate? First, it was about coming up with a joint policy towards Poland. Basically, Poland was meant to disappear from the map of the world. Secondly, they wanted to eliminate the intellectual elites of the Polish state. For that reason, a, B, and cutting. A, B is a German action, but basically it happened at roughly the same time. It was aimed at eliminating educated people in Poland. Now, thirdly, both Germans and Russians wanted to inform the other party about the Polish underground efforts, the Polish resistance, in other words. So, basically, it was about cooperating together against all these efforts that were directed against both occupiers. Meetings took place. Gestapo officers and NKVD officers met. I believe they took place in 1939 and 1914, Krakow and possibly also in Lvov, Lviv. Um, I'm not sure, but I believe so. High tier meetings, I would say. A number of issues were discussed. At none of that meetings, we, there was any evidence that the Germans were informed in detail about the Katyn massacre. So I have not found any evidence to that effect. You know, we did this and you probably did that. So there was an exchange of information, a common policy vis-a-vis -vis the Polish society was considered. However, the Katyn massacre 
was not disclosed to Germans, at least at the time. The Germans might have asked for ask the Soviets to release certain people that they care about. There were certain German citizens imprisoned by the Soviets, for example, those that had served in the German army. And those officers got released, but it was not because Germans were informed of the pending executions and that it was the last moment to do that. It was the German officers' families that came up with this initiative. What about Josef Czapski? There, it was due to the Italian court's intervention. The neutral countries also intervened. So new, the neutral states uh, were appealing to the German authorities to release some persons. So I think that uh, if there were meetings, and there were meetings, I'm sure we have certainty that those meetings of NKWD uh, and uh, Gestapo, they were not talking about uh, the executions in Katyn. That is my state of knowledge. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong, but I have not found any documents to state the other. More questions, please? Any more questions? Yes, I would concur that most probably there was no foreknowledge of the fact because of the time of release of this information. Uh, this was not released immediately after uh, Germans occupied uh, uh, terrain where cutting was located. So but most probably, uh, if they knew uh, beforehand, uh, this information would become public much earlier. Um, next question. Uh, is it possible that Russians uh, tried to uh, frame uh, Germans using German ammunition uh, uh, during the uh, conduct of the uh, murders? Uh, the Yes, yes, and that is very important because, as I said before, in the period 1939-41, both the Germans and the Soviets were allies, and that is the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact that was used as the basis for unleashing the offensive against Poland and prior to the outbreak of the war against the Soviet Union in 1941, both countries were supporting each other. For instance, in the period of the attack against France, the Soviet Union sent to Germany, was sending to Germany some strategic war materials. The Germans were helping the Soviet Union. They were giving military help to the Soviet Union in weaponry and uh, ammunition. So that was uh, uh, quite an intensive cooperation on the day of unleashing aggression of the German Reich against the Soviet Union. On the border, there were trains that were ready uh, to cross uh, the Soviet German border because until the very moment of time both countries were concealing their aims and objectives and uh, Germany did not want to, to unmask their at attack so in fact the last trains from Germany to the Soviet Union were um, going on the night when the, the war began and uh, in the Soviet army they were using German ammunition. Not only the Soviets were using German ammunition, and that Germans were sending their ammunition to the countries all over the world, and the Soviets uh, were executing, um, were doing executions, carrying out executions with the use of German ammunition. And uh, when medical commissions uh, were investigating the cutting massacre on site, they immediately had to face the problem. What? to do with the munitions they found. And that was the German munitions because Germans initially tried to conceal that because that was uh, an evidence uh, that would uh, 
corroborate the thesis that it was the Germans who committed the crime. So um, they were not talking about it in the German press, for instance, because it was, that was an important argument against Germany. And um, that could have been a crown piece of evidence because the Germans were saying, right, we found uh, the victims of the Soviet crimes. So we had found uh, tens of thousands of uh, Polish officers murdered and their remains had been identified. And um, um, indeed, on uh, the crime scene, they found some munitions. And then it turns out that they were of German manufacturing. So immediately, that would go against the German line of argumentation. So initially, they were silencing that fact. And only later on, when once uh, Bordenko's uh, committee uh, started working and became more famous, the German arguments were used in such a way so as to explain the international community, the origin of uh, the German munition that uh, was used there. And, uh, the case was established and was clarified, but for some time, that was quite a problematic issue. It was quite a confounding factor for the Germans. And um, and so later on, it was explained and it became a meaningful piece of evidence, but it was easy to explain. Um, Germ German factories were selling those uh, ammunitions to many munitions to many different countries, and um, within the framework of Soviet uh, Nazi uh, military cooperation, the Russians were not using any other munitions because they were using the munitions they were receiving from the Third Reich. So that is the case uh, that has already been described in the scientific literature. But then in 1943 and later in 1944, that particular factor could work against the German interpretation of uh, the course of events. And indeed, at that time, it was a confounding factor. Next question, please. Next question. Uh, we had 400 uh, officers that were spared by the Russians, either because of their alleged uh, pro-Russian sympathy is, or sympathies, or because of the possible usefulness for, for uh, different uh, projects of the Soviet state. Okay. Uh, can you tell um, how many of them became prominent uh, as far as uh, uh, their use, uh, let's say, in p political uh, uh, fights in, in Poland uh, with the, uh, the po Polish uh, underground state or after the war? Well, indeed, There's, those are those who survived, the survivors, miraculous survivors. Quite an interesting issue because for some time there was even that piece of information that those are the people who were the people who started cooperating with the Soviet authorities. Partially that was true. Because uh, some of the survivors uh, in Nostashkov, uh, Nestorovsk, and uh, Kozhelsk declared their will to start cooperation with the Soviets. There were a few dozens, uh, dozens of those, but the others were, from the point of view of the Soviet Union, the others were of scientific value, or they had some important military skills. As far as the scientific value is concerned, that is to say that those, uh, for instance, Arsenievich, a Polish scientist, he is the flagship example of the survivors, professor of uh, the Stefan Batore University in Vilnius. And that professor had uh, scientific internships in the Third Reich, and he was the specialist in Nazi and Soviet economy. So the Soviets came to a conclusion that in the future, once the, there is a breakout of the war against uh, Nazi Germany and Stalin was knew it would happen one day, then undoubtedly having a scientist like that would be helpful. 
also uh, dozens of medical doctors survived and those were Polish professors of medicine from the military medicine faculty. So if you look at the, the list of survivors, if you think of it, it turns out uh, many of those who survived were medical doctors. And at the very last moment, they were, it was decided that they would not perish. Also among the survivors, those were the specialists in foreign languages. So they selected uh, a number of Polish specialists in, uh, the, in a number of um, foreign languages that were not very much in use. And there is this uh, strange domain in linguistics. And in the two camps, uh, there were some outstanding uh, Polish uh, inventors uh, from the faculty of uh, military technology. So some of those inventors were killed, but some of those inventors survived. And then, as just like Tadeusz Felsztyn, some of them were later on carrying out their scientific activities in the British Isles with uh, quite, a, quite a big benefit to the Allies. So of the survivors, were any of them of any significance later on? If we look in at the period of the war, then out of the survivors, if my memory serves me right, no one of those during the war, I emphasize, none of them um, took part in the operations of the Polish underground. But some of the survivors later on were very much important people in the Polish army. And the best career was done by Professor Wacław Komarnicki. And he turned out to be Minister of Justice in 1941. He returned. Well, after Majski, uh, Sikorski um, agreement, he was uh, sent to uh, the uh, UK and he was a minister in the Polish government in the exile. Many Polish officers uh, were promoted to high ranks and many of them became quite um, outstanding military inventors and many of them served in the army, in the Polish army. And um, they were serving in the army at high ranks, General, General Wojciechowski, Colonel Kubicki, Colonel Felsztyn. Those are the people, those were the people who served in the army as line officers. And I also would like to speak about another interesting person. It's an example of a soldier who whose life was sent due to his uh, military career. Uh, Natsas Wupianowski, cavalry captain. He was um, a hero of the Kodziowce uh, battle. His soldiers, the cavalry soldiers, um, that's, um, <clears throat> um, dismounted uh, the cavalry horses and they were fighting as the infantry. And during the skirmishes, some say it was a battle, they were capable of uh, destroying 20 Soviet tanks. That was um, the greatest Soviet um, failure in the brief Polish-Soviet war in 1939. But Wupianowski was a prisoner of war in the Soviet hands. So one might think that he was doomed to die quickly. However, someone thought of his name and associated his name with that particular battle. And then the Red Army generals or maybe higher than that, maybe somewhere in the Kremlin, someone said, okay, how about serving for the Red Army? And the Russians said, listen, Captain, well, of course, I'm, I've been coloring a little bit, but this is more or less how it could be. They said, Captain, you know, we're going to have a war with Germany, so we're going to fight against the Germans as well. So you have this experience. And... Um, 
at Kajotse, you showed what you were capable of as a commander. So how about serving for the Red Army? You choose your rank and position, and you choose where you want to fight. And Wupianowski disagreed, but he survived. And then later on, he could make his own depositions. So this is yet another example of a, an interesting case. And, and it's not the military career that saved him because uh, it is not to say that he was an outstanding officer, but still he did make his huge contribution in demasking of all of that that was happening in the Soviet Union because he made his depositions uh, to the Carstens Committee in the US. And Karsten's committee was um, unveiling the Stalin's crimes. And at that time, Wopinovsky there, he made his depositions and uh, his um, facts, uh, his, stories was, uh, his story was very important. So there are people, there are stories, there are different biographies, but those who survived, most uh, of them uh, made their military career. They were serving in the Polish army in the West. And practically speaking, all of them stayed in emigration. Later, they never returned to Poland. May I have the next question, please? Next question. Uh, is there a direct relationship between the discovery of the cutting gra graves and uh, the murder of uh, General Sikorski? That's a question that pops up, pops up quite often. Indeed, there was this moment when historians interpreted this issue in this light, namely, General Sikorski was overly involved in the cutting crime and as a result he died in the Gibraltar catastrophe. I saw films, videos on this very subject. Also books were published including books that were written in Germany by not so much historians but amateur historians, and they claim that these two events were interconnected. So the British archives are not open to the Polish historians, and that suggests that there is something there, namely, it is possible that General Sikorski paid the highest prize for his attempts to solve the Soviet crimes. In the documents that I studied, I didn't find any confirmation to that effect, but it might have been the case though. Professor Gdynka, my close personal friend, studies the Polish-British relationship. And he is very knowledgeable about that. He we actually studied documents, the public record office, which stores all the publicly available documents, not a single document that he find there that would confirm the theory that Sikorsky's death is anyway linked to the cat in crime. However, there are still the documents that are not available to us and that there might be confirmation there. I believe that some documents will remain classified by the British for another 20 years. Some people claim that it is not due to the cat and crime, that it's caused by something else. By the way, allegedly, let me stress that it is not something that I'm coming up with. Allegedly, then, there are those documents that have not been available made available to the uh, Polish historians and it covers or deals with the fact that Sikorsky had some kind of a relationship with the Vichy government 
which would be a stain on his character. Now, the cat in crime, the suggestion that we have heard at this point is not justified. The situation might change once we have gotten access to all the British documents, including those that remain for the time being classified. May I have the next question, please? Yes, uh, uh, Mrs. Pilkowska is asking several questions. One of them is uh, why um, Institute of National Remembrance is uh, failing to pressure the British government actually to uh, release uh, and reveal the documents that uh, re relate to Frank uh, Strobran, uh, Stubant, uh, Captain Gilder, and Colonel Stevenson mm -hmm. testimonies. Let me just answer it one by one. Let me start with the first one. Christina, I know Christina very well. I've been to the US and I met her at the Józef Piłsudski Institute. Christina has written an important book on the cutting witnesses. I have read it with great pleasure. I know that she uh, is a great expert in the field. So, hello to you. Now your question. So the Institute of National Remembrance, they didn't do about this. They did nothing about this at this point. Maybe, maybe one could do something about that in the foreseeable future. I'm a member of the Institute of the National Remembrance College. In this term, I had the college's work. So I will actually make this appeal to President Navrotsky at the next meeting. And by the way, he is somewhere close to you. He is in the US now. I don't know where exactly. So I will ask him we may suggest that we turn to various British institutions so that they make available number of documents. So I understand that certain efforts have been made, but Christina got a file that was empty. So as you can see, you have good intentions and it gives you nothing. And I've just learned that uh, Mr. Navrotsky is in Chicago right now. Anyway, back to the subject at hand. It's a very good idea. The Institute for National Remembrance is the most relevant body and it should be the Institute to actually tackle this issue. By the way, they are in touch with the foreign ministry, they have good rapport, so maybe jointly something could happen. I'm not sure whether it's going to work or not, but first we need to give it a try, right? We need to give it a try first. Without that, we don't know how successful it's going to be. However, this is the right way of thinking. I am the president of the College of the National Members Institute. So I, as uh, in this capacity, I will put this matter to the college and to the institute. Uh, there were two questions that related to elimination of uh, Polish elites. Uh, uh, this is a context of uh, intelligence action. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, cutting kind of dwarfs uh, in comparison with what was happening uh, in the western part of Poland after um, this uh, Poland, uh, Polish uh, territory was occupied by Germany. Um, 
Pomorze, Wielkopolska, all this intelligent uh, action, Pomern, uh, Posen, Slesien, Litzmannstadt, uh, this actually resulted in deaths of uh, maybe up to 90,000 people within just several months of occupation of uh, those territories. Uh, could you shed some light uh, on it? Uh, these are two questions that I combined into one, actually. Sure. Yes, this question is very important indeed and a very dramatic question in that. It's important for all Poles. Let's be honest about that. Let's look at the Polish intelligentsia before World War II. There were few and far between. So, when Poland had been partitioned, Poles could study in various academic centers in Europe, in Vienna, or France, in Paris. But then after the war, it was rather difficult to build a strong Polish society and academic elites. So what happened in 1939 and 1940 was absolutely terrible. And this is a crime that was committed both by the Soviets and by the Germans. The Polish elites were decimated, by the way, officers were also well-educated, so they were also members of the intelligentsia. So you have cutting, that's the first crime. Secondly, you had Western Ukraine, yes, Western Belarus, people imprisoned there. You've got Palmyry, you've got Wawer, Piasznica, Also, the German concentration camps, because the Germans started to establish them as of 1940, and what we see are tens of thousands of victims. So there was this uh, council, uh, uh, the Polish council in London. So. It, a discussion on what is happening in Poland. Adam Bragier, one of the delegates representing the Polish Socialist Party. He is having a conversation with another member of this parliament in exile, if you will. So he says, Poles are being executed. En masse. Polish Jews are being executed. En masse. And he says another thing. What's happened in the last dozen days or so? Tens of thousands of people were killed. A hundred thousand, possibly 200,000 people killed in the last two weeks. And they are actually talking about thinking, what do we do now? What do we do about that? So one of the members of this council says the following words. Tomorrow we can write the Germans murdered in Poland in a matter of two weeks, 200,000 people. If we write that, nobody is going to believe that. Nobody. Nobody will believe that this is the scale. So we could write something else in our message. Let's write that tens or hundreds of people were killed because this will be believable. By the way, those numbers were real. A hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand people. These were actual numbers, but people worldwide didn't believe that. Coming back to cutting and other crimes, crimes committed in the Polish intelligentsia by the Germans. So what would be the best example? So there are those two sisters, 
Dobur Mushnitsky's daughter. General Dobur Mushnitsky's daughter, to be exact. Lewandowska is murdered in Katyn. She is an inmate in Pozielsko. She has been identified. By the way, this name will never be made public because the Germans didn't know what to do with that. Because they never assumed that a woman could be there with men. Then the situation was actually explained. She is a Soviet victim. Roughly at the same time, in Poznań, her sister is murdered by the Germans. She is a member of the Polish resistance fighting the Germans. Two sisters, one killed by the Soviets, the other by the Germans. So it all shows um, how dramatic was the fate of the Poles. There's just one uh, family. He had two daughters, General had two daughters, and both died during World War II. Both died on the battlefield. One of uh, uh, one of the women was a pilot, and she fight um, and fight, and um, the other daughter was uh, involved uh, in um, anti in anti-German activities in the underground. So yes, there were so many stories like that, so many more stories like that, but that was not a coincidence. Both sides, that is the Soviets and the Germans, wanted to eliminate Polish intelligentsia. The Polish state was supposed to no longer exist. The Poles were not meant to have, to have their own statehood. The Poles were there to stay as slaves for some time because the gradation for execution was the following, as far as the Germans are concerned, first the Jews, then the Roma, then the Slavs, the Polish included, and the Russians had a somewhat different uh, logic. So first and foremost, uh, to eliminate the Polish intelligentsia, intelligentsia hence the four deportations in 1940 and 41. And some saying, we're saying that as many as 1,500,000 people were deported. Maybe this is too much, too many, but there is this dispute among the historians how many people were actually deported. But in any case, I think, well, I don't think I know, I'm sure that that was uh, an element of um, that uh, um, activity, that the objective which was to eliminate Polish uh, intelligence and the cutting operation, um, the cutting operation had its reverberations because fathers, grandfathers and sons uh, and brothers were killed in cutting and their families were taken in uh, to the forest. So, so the Russians were trying to conceal the traces to cover up and uh, to um, take away all of the witness because if people are in Kazakhstan or somewhere in the steppe far away, they would not be looking for their husbands, brothers, cousins and grandfathers. So that was a crime that was meant to be well hidden. And um, that crime was committed in order to get rid of the Polish intelligentsia to begin with and then of the Poles. So the war then was um, going on and um, um, Germany started to the war against the Soviet Union, but who knows how it could have been had it been a different course of events. Any more questions, please? A sh short uh, comment uh, on my part. Uh, my family comes uh, from an uh, area around Bobrovsk, uh, historically speaking, uh, um, and uh, a good portion of my family actually after 1920, after the Riga Treaty uh, was left outside of the po Polish borders. And uh, uh, so uh, we have uh, within the family 
um, actually lots of additional uh, history that is not covered here by uh, the topics that we uh, started operation um, po Polish operation of 1937-38 um, there is 17 uh, Yeshmans on the list of um, Russian memorial as uh, victims of uh, uh, ju just a Polish operation in 1937-38 uh, so there is a broader context. It's it's not that, that killing started in 1939. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, basically much much longer period from 1917. Uh, uh, yeah. Lots of Poles uh, uh, were murdered uh, in the territories that uh, were uh, left uh, after the Riga Treaty. Um, so th this was a general comment. Uh, also uh, going to the west, uh, my. Grandfather was a mayor of Schwem, uh, that's uh, Wielkopolska, and uh, he was on the prescriptions, uh, prescription list. He survived the war, but he was murdered in 1946 after the war. Um, so he was in, in hiding for uh, uh, over six years. Um, so all these things uh, are very much connected here, uh, both the elimination of elites on the uh, uh, eastern side of, of Poland as well, well as on the on, uh, western part. Um, next question is about uh, a contemporary yeah. issue. Uh, this is um, a lawsuits that were or originated uh, uh, in uh, Strasbourg, uh, International Tribunal against Russia. Uh, nothing came out of it as far as I know. Um, do you have any uh, comments uh, uh, what uh, was actually the official uh, stated reason why uh, the international tribunal uh, did not proceed with this case. As far as uh, this case is concerned, Well, to begin with, it's a difficult case to proceed with. That is due to the fact that Russia is the country that is not particularly interested in having that case, because they, that may lead to some um, compensations, big compensations to be paid. Um, because any crime means uh, victims and members of families of the of those who are murdered at a later stage may press their claims before the court. Therefore, I don't know which Russian institutions were active in that because I was not following that particular case. It's more for the lawyers, but. From what I know, the general tune is not to proceed with the case because that may in the future lead to attempts of um, claiming compensation and the Polish lawyers who were representing the Polish interests in that case and who were operating in this EU legal environment, they were openly saying that it was not about compensation. They were saying that the point was to close um, the case, to have it settled, to have decisions taken, so as not to return to it. Uh, so what actually happened, I do not know, but I know that the, this case was um, um, being initiated um, a number of times, but the, but the Polish lawyers were not working in the environment conducive to investigating that problem, clarifying that problem. So the first court decisions were not favorable. So what's going to happen next, I do not know. I have not been dealing with that particular case. I'm just consuming 
um, that knowledge. I have been reading about that uh, court case in the Polish press, and in the Polish press, they were saying that there was yet another failed attempt to, to run a court case. But after that, the case was um, no longer on the table. So perhaps uh, this question should rather be addressed to the Polish lawyers who were involved in that particular case. But actually, it's uh, not my cup of tea, and I do not have knowledge, detailed knowledge, on that particular case. So I'm not in the position to give you any specific information. All I know that it was a failed attempt. And um, there was that pot potential possibility that it was all about a possibility of pressing for claims. But was it the main reason? Perhaps it was not the main reason in the case. I just do not know. But all I know that at some point um, there was a lot of talk about possible compensation. So next question, please. Uh, again, uh, Kristina Pjorkowski uh, is asking for more information about different uh, reports. Uh, I am not really familiar with uh, absolute majority of them, so it's, it's difficult for me to even uh, convey it here uh, logically. But most probably, I would suggest uh, that you two have some uh, contact after uh, this uh, meeting here, and uh, most probably some form of cooperation as far as creation of uh, additional pressure on uh, British government would be. Uh, uh, something uh, sensible here, uh, most probably uh, in, uh, our uh, IPN sh should uh, be a part of it also. Just uh, two or three comments on that, because uh, I think uh, that uh, Ms., uh, uh, Mrs. Birkowska means that those who are investigating the cutting uh, uh, massacre and those people who visited uh, the cutting site in 1943, they uh, drafted some documentation upon their visit and those documents uh, were written as uh, reports and uh, there is a there is more than a dozen of such reports of different value of different volume there were also reports made by the British. Uh, there were also reports uh, made by the Americans. And there are also reports of medical doctors of the International Medical Committee, Valtteri Kergetrans, and Francois Neville, and others also wrote the report. So I think that Christina um, is probably interested in, most probably trying, uh, interested in trying to use those reports. Luckily, those reports uh, have survived until today. They have not been damaged and they are available. So how about printing, publishing those reports? That is a very good idea because uh, Malaysia expert opinion will be there. One fleet's opinion will be there. We will have many other documents that were written by Wojcicki, by, by, by Skarzyński. So we'll have um, reports made uh, by medical doctors, by Gertl, and um, by Seyfried, and by many more uh, people who uh, either were in Katyn, but for some reason, uh, or the other were dealing with that. Uh, so there are reports uh, drafted by um, by the Americans, by the, by Poles, Americans, British, Italians, uh, Swiss, and representatives of other countries. And maybe such a publication, published in the Polish language and published in the English language, would be a very important item position of uh, great substantive value and uh, also would uh, give uh, a rank and file reader better understanding of the situation. All I can say that uh, 
most probably in spring next year, we will finally publish after many endeavors all of the cutting memoirs. So all those notes that have survived uh, the cutting mass for all the documents that were collected from the pockets of victims and currently they're being archived in the Institute of National Membranes. So those uh, notes shall be published finally. And that publication will bear the resemblance of the documents. Those will be the scans of the documents. It would be as if reading the originals um, uh, accompanied uh, by uh, commentary of historians and linguists uh, and uh, also there may be the commentaries of some other specialists because the word gives a possibility to have an insight into emotions and emotions are within the remit of linguists sociologists and psychologists and so i have asked the Institute of National Remembrance to address uh, scientists and other fields of knowledge to create not just a volume containing the memoirs, but perhaps we should do more. How about analyzing those memoirs? And how about describing um, or annotating them with the specialists from many different uh, fields of science? And uh, I'm looking forward to this book being published because First and foremost, there's going to be the first ever full publication of the so-called memoir. Sometimes it's just a brief note because we think that memoir means a voluminous book and so on and so forth. No, not necessarily. Sometimes it's a note. It's just a sheet of paper, one page, two pages, three pages of text. It's not the Solsky's memoir who that was found um, at uh, Major Solsky and uh, uh, then collected in Katyn, and then it was uh, published. Yes, indeed, that is quite a big um, set of memoirs with many pages, but sometimes it's just a few sentences. But yes, we're talking about those cutting memoirs, and if that is published together with the reports, then undoubtedly we're going to have two best-selling publishing um, items. So, so I, indeed, I would love to talk Christina to Christina about that, and perhaps we might think how to cooperate on that matter. If I could have the next question, please. Okay, uh, maybe this will be the last question. Uh, the question is about mm -hmm. the cinematic portrayal of uh, Katyn um, by Vaida. Uh, how uh, true and uh, how much of a fiction it, it was as far as uh, uh, specific aspect uh, of uh, uh, reaction of the Polish society uh, of, uh, after uh, the release of this information. Tak, to jest... Um, o, pani Krystyna mi napisała w tej chwili, że... Krystyna wszystkim... has just written. She will be in Warsaw in January, so we will meet and we will discuss just that. Basically, a fresh bit of information. So when it comes to report, that makes sense. Let me return to your question, Mr. Moderator. Andrzej Vida's film. Let me address it the following way. There have been four documentaries on cutting. The first made in 1943 and then the last one 1952. The first one, a German documentary in German and in Polish. It's 20 odd minute long. Then there was another shorter documentary made by the French because Brazila, a French writer, visited Katyn in 1943 and this documentary was made for the French soldiers that fought in the east. The French army fought the Soviet army just like the Spanish there was this blue division. The French collaborated with the Third Reich, they fought against the French and then there was the Soviet film made by the Soviets that covered Bubenka's committee's works. And the fourth one 
was made by the Polish emigres in London. Not so well known. I presented it at two academic conferences because I brought it here to Poland. I also showed it in New York at the Zofiusudski Institute. A few dozen people were present. Coming back to Vida's film, his motion picture, I like it a lot. There is some fiction there, but there is also a lot of truth in it. What do I mean by true? Because the author actually looked into the heart of the matter. So the question pertained to how the Poles reacted to it. You see, 1943 there, General Smoravinsky's family is in Kraków, and they learn that the victims are being identified. There is a list, and we see General Smolavinsky's name there, and it's actually the case. The first message published in two local papers, you can find General Smolavinsky's name. It's not fiction. And I mean here the papers published in Polish by Germans. And there are people queuing up to buy these issues because those poor quality papers are the only source on the Soviet's crime. And this was basically the only subject that was covered well by the Germans in the Polish language press. It was the only subject they did lie about. Furthermore, Polish readers could voice their own opinions. And it was actually very much publicized an issue by the Germans. The Germans wanted this information to reach the loved ones of the victims murdered in cutting. So basically, it was a part of their propaganda efforts. Notice, what do we see in Vida's film? You can see an excerpt from a German documentary made in 1943. There's more to it. Dr. Pawlusz Pawrowski is mentioned. There is a short commentary too. We learn that Dr. Pawrowski studies a victim that has been exhumed. Tadeusz Pragnowski was a member of the Polish Red Cross Committee that actually studied the crime. Dote Katynia is a book that I wrote. It was translated into English in the US. Mad Ms. Pravowska, Pravowski's daughter, actually approached me and she sent all the papers she had on the subject. And by the way, I told her that you can see your father in this German propaganda video from 1943. She didn't know it at the time. So, what about 1945? The victims' families were trying to commemorate their loved ones. They put up plaques in cemeteries. And actually, this is what we find in the film, and it was the case. Such things did happen. Families would try to establish the whereabouts of their father, of their grandfather, of their loved ones. People would write letters to the highest authorities of the, of the uh, communist Poland. Fala 49, way 49, it was a show. People would write 
letters to Fala 49 way 49 and they would inquire about cutting thousands of letters were sent signed by a desperate wife waiting for her husband and crying children waiting to see their dad and those letters asked for an explanation what is happening years have been passing and we still don't know the whereabouts of our loved ones. So what Andrzej Vajda did in his film was he used information that he learned from historic, historical books. And on top of that, he added certain layer of fiction, which, which is what directors do because they need to build this tension, right? because they add elements to the story so that their picture becomes even more dramatic, so that there is an angle in it. Yes, you might find events there that never happened, but this is what happens in films. You mix facts and fiction. This is the prerogative of an artist, I believe. This is what film is about it was not a documentary after all in a documentary you need to be very close to the truth and we do that in a motion picture in a film you rely on facts you do but there are things that have been added facts are mixed with fiction, but I don't mind. This is just how I see it. This is just my take on that. And by the way, the film was really good. By the way, for him, it was a personal film because his father died in Katyn, Kapitan Vajda, Captain Vajda. So basically, uh, the director was duty bound to make this film. If there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Professor Volsha, thank you very much for your great presentation. We hope that this is just the beginning of uh, our more um, planned and uh, more strategic uh, contacts, uh, uh, both with you and uh, the Cortica Foundation. Uh, there is a definite need for, uh, you know, uh, conferences and lectures here. And uh, uh, we hope that this will be just the first step uh, 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 the long uh, co cooperation. Um, so, uh, Jean, uh, I wonder if you have any additional comments. Uh? Well, I would simply just say that. Uh, yes, I'm Jean Kuyetil. Ah, suppression. Uh, apologies, sorry. My apologies to you, sir. Uh, no, I, I certainly uh, agree with what uh, Wojtek said, and uh, we certainly do, I think, very much appreciate uh, this extensive scholarly work that you provided to us and expanded our knowledge of this area. This is really, truly uh, something that goes to the heart of, of uh, Poles uh, and Polish diaspora. So we do thank you, and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, our relationship with the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Thank you very much. Let me thank you for your attention. Thank you for bearing with me. I apologize. I took a lot of your time. But this is what happens sometimes. You see that your audience is interested and then time disappears. And by the way, Cutting is so important that time should be irrelevant. We should simply keep talking about it, no matter what time it is, whether it is 5, 6 or 7 p.m. Cutting is timeless. This is a thing that needs to be discussed and we need to do it well. Thank you for this meeting. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my work. And thank you for the questions that you have put to me. Some of them have been helpful in making things clearer. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.
Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say a few words. I would like to follow up on Professor Volsha's work. One of his books has been given an award back in 2017 in the first edition of our competition. Our foundation has been working towards making this issue better known. We have been doing that because of how important this issue is for our identity. Furthermore, cutting is very important for the Polish historical efforts. In 2017, our foundation organized an academic session involving the professor as well as other eminent experts in this field, both in, from Poland and from Russia, including representatives of the memorial organization. Your book has been promoted in the US in cooperation with the Polish Institute for National Remembrance. We, our foundation has prepared the Cat and Massacre of the Country Search, a book reviewed among others by Professor Bertrand Martin, from a professor from the University in Freiburg. In this volume, you see a summary and comments on the on the research on cutting. Basically, it is a summary of the state of research as of 2017. Professor Volsha and other experts have included the works there, and we see different aspects of this crime. And we also see how different experts differently approach that matter. Why am I saying that? Because I'm trying to show that our foundation has been trying to make excellent works better known, such as professors work, but also we'd like to take this opportunity to present the Polish academic efforts. And also we wish to support those instruments that help us to tell Polish, to talk about Polish history, to tell about this history to the world. I would like to thank our staff. I would like to thank uh, um, also to thank uh, Jean uh, Sokolowski, to thank uh, Wojciech Jeszman, Jeszman. I would also would like to thank uh, uh, for your kind uh, agreement uh, and um, your interest in co-organizing this event. I also would like to thank uh, Professor Wojcza uh, for uh, sharing with us a very interesting um, lecture and uh, for giving extensive answers to the questions and judging by the um, messages on the chat. That has been quite an intellectual feast for all of us. So, dear Professor, thank you ever so much. And now it is uh, over to my colleague, to Veronika, um, who is uh, the uh, coordinator of uh, this uh, project, The Seeds of History, over to you. Yes, thank you very much for your kind participation in today's meeting. Uh, already today, I'm inviting you to take part in the next meeting that will be organized within the framework of this project. This will be a conference on the title Seeds of History. Um, uh, the uh, Polish diaspora and the Poles of uh, the ambassadors of the good name of Poland abroad. So that is going to be on the 18th of December 2021 at um, 5 p.m. Polish time. And as far as the details are concerned, please uh, um, follow our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So thank you very much for your participation in today's meeting. Thank you very much for all your questions. All the best and bye-bye. Goodbye. Do